So, what I want to talk about. Um, I, I spent about eight years working at one of the, I think, uh, most effective agile delivery firms in the world. They're exceptionally good at what they do, and they are uh, very, very fussy about uh, um, recruiting, who they hire, how they train them, how they get them doing things. These guys are, you know, what I'm trying to get across is that they're at the top of their game. Time after time, I would see the same pattern emerge. We would go in, we would deliver something usually pretty special in a very short time frame. Uh, people would be happy and energized, and we'd all be friends, and then we'd leave, and I'd come back six months, a year, 18 months later, and everything had just reverted, and it was heartbreaking. And it happens once or twice, and you think, okay, this is just unfortunate. And then there's, well, for me, certainly something clicked, and I just went, right, okay, I need to figure out what causes this stuff to revert and what we could do about it. And I spent about, I don't know, the last probably two years while I was with ThoughtWorks trying to solve that, um, and then the four years or so since. Um, and I'm still struggling with it. And where I've got to is, is Agile doesn't scale. And, and I know people are going to throw things at me, uh, hopefully money uh, rather than fruit. But no, um, what's interesting is the most common counter-argument I hear for Agile does scale, Dan. You just need to X. You just need to do this thing. Is what I can't help hearing is like, cars do float, Dan. You can make a car float. You just need to roll it onto a ferry. And then it's fine. And at the other end, the car rolls off, and the car floated. That's not a function of the car. OK, the car was able to, because you put stuff around it. Uh, um, and really what I want to talk about today is the stuff that you need to put around Agile to give it a chance of surviving over time. OK? Uh, um, and I'm talking, when I, when I use the word Agile, I'm talking the, you know, the broad church of Agile delivery methods. Uh, Chris Matz is an independent consultant in the UK. Um, recently, in fact, in the last couple of days, um, blogged something I thought was really useful to this conversation, which is he says, when we say Agile, do you mean Agile as in the values in the original manifesto? Do you mean Agile as in as it is practiced? Or Agile the brand? OK, and, and I'm not going to you know, answer that. I'm just saying, when you're talking with each other and with your, you know, your, your colleagues, maybe uh, customers, clients, about that, try and figure out which one of those you're using. Maybe use different words. So why Agile doesn't scale? This is a rubbish title. OK, so how about this? How Agile can cross the chasm and why it usually doesn't. OK. Um, I'm going to talk about which chasm as well as we go. So, okay, here's what the talk isn't, okay? And this is the talk I keep seeing in various different places, which kind of prompted me to, to want to, to rail against it a bit. <laughs> a guaranteed formula for scaling agile. Star, not guaranteed, or a formula. Okay, uh, that's a complete ripoff of. Uh, there's an a, a advert on the side of a bus in a Simpsons episode where it says, free money, and a little star. Not free, which I just thought was brilliant. So, OK, first of all, we need to get some terms out here. What do we mean by scale? There's lots of different ways you can scale delivery. And when I say delivery, what I'm talking about is technical, technological solutions to business problems. So I'm staying very much in the sort of enterprise space. Uh, um, so because that, that's what I know. Uh, um, so what do we mean by scale? We can scale out across a number of axes. We can scale to solve bigger problems. Well, I think actually agile methods have a really good story around this. I've seen big complex problems solved using, you know, uh, short iterations, short release cycles, rapid feedback, good customer engagement. Uh, um, you know attention to the, 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 uh, the rigor of software, so the, the practices, your, like your TDD and your you know, proper unit testing and automation, and those things are very, very good at taking a kernel of an idea and growing it and growing it and growing it. Now, I just noticed Ola Binney's wandering around the building somewhere, and he built out the most incredibly 
I think, wonderful and complicated um, modeling system for trying to understand genomes and mutations in cancer development. Right? I, I, I got all of those words wrong. Okay, but, but look up this talk, it's amazing. And he started with, you know, well, because he's a Lisp guy, so he started with a pair of parentheses and just built out from there and built this thing. So that, I think you can solve big problems as long as you, you, you have the space, if you like, to grow them in the way that you need to grow them. Bigger solutions. There's an assumption, there's a learned assumption that big problems need big solutions. And really often, Big problems don't need big solutions. You may have a tiny, tiny, tiny problem, sorry, tiny, tiny, tiny root cause that is causing all kinds of mayhem to emerge. Uh, I use the word root cause guardedly because it makes it sound like there is such a thing as cause and effect rather than systems influencing each other. But, you know, it's a good approximation. So in a lot of cases, big problems don't need big solutions. Sometimes they do. Uh, um, and, and this is where things get interesting. What I mean by scaling is big programs of work. Big programs of work means many people. Okay? So it may be that the thing we're trying to do is very wide, and there's lots of maybe interdependencies, and it's very time constrained. I need to do this thing in a short amount of time. I need lots of bodies on it. I'm aware that you know nine women can't have a baby in a month and all of that stuff. I'm also aware that if I have you know, two, three, five, 12 teams, I'm not going to get two, three, five, 12 times the throughput because I've got all the communication overhead. But if I can get good at that, I can get more than one X. Right? There is, a, there is a, a, a function of scaling. So when I talk about scale, um, I'm talking about taking on bigger problems with more people. So, so why is that hard? Why could that possibly be hard? We know, you know we've got our core values of, of communication and simplicity and, and all those things are already called out for us. So as long as we just keep doing those, we're going to be fine. Yeah, surely that's going to make sense. Well, the problem we've got is that when you have lots of teams doing stuff, particularly, ironically, lots of very experienced, very highly skilled teams, they're going to solve things locally. And they're going to solve things locally in really interesting and surprising ways. You're going to look at something and go, wow, it hadn't even occurred to me you could do that. That's brilliant. Which is fine if they're the only people in town. If they're not the only people in town, you get that same thing happening in lots of different places. And local optimizations. And the problem we've got is that doesn't roll up into anything useful. What that rolls up into, well, I'll give you an example. I come from the UK. In the UK, many you know, thousands of years ago, this is before we got invaded by everyone. Actually, we did get invaded by pretty much everyone. Um, so back before those days, you, you basically had, you had uh, the Welsh, uh, you had the, the people living in Scotland were actually picked. The Scotty came over from Ireland. So that's a funny one. But you had these different places and they spoke different languages. So you, you, you had uh, Celtic and Picty and uh, the other ones, right? And, and the reason for that wasn't they were just sort of, you know, being contrary. It was geography. Okay? So when you have, and we didn't have, we don't have mountains in England, but we've got some pretty in, impressive hills. And, and we've got these hills running up the middle of the country. And that meant the people on one side of the hills spoke a different language. Okay? They had locally optimized communication. They didn't need to, they probably didn't even know these guys were here until they kind of started running out of stuff and then went, invading and went, hey, you guys speak a different language. If we hit you hard enough, you'll start speaking our language. Sounds a bit like enterprise consulting, actually. But, you know, and we still do. And, 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 and interestingly as well, while we're on the subject of language, look at what happens over time. So the, uh, in whatever it was, 16-something, we, we, we chucked out a load of uh, proto-Americans or they'd say the founding fathers left Plymouth and went to, went to America. Uh, um, and at that time, we all spoke the same language. We spoke 17th century English. Uh, um, and they spoke it with a West Country accent, because that's where most of them are from. And so that because again, geography, that diverged into what is now various different flavors of American uh, dialect. 
and, and various different flavors of English dialects. So they've diverged, and spellings and, and idioms and those kind of things diverge. It's a very similar thing. So as we're designing systems, as we're designing software, there's no such thing as emergent architecture at scale or emergent design at scale. Emergent design at scale is a platypus, right? a duck-billed platypus, which is a, uh, an evolutionary uh, wonderful thing. It's perfectly adapted to its environment. I wouldn't want to maintain one. I wouldn't want to be the guy who goes, well, hang on a minute, it's got this thing at the front and a what at the back, a tail? Hang on, how does that work? I, it's really, it's, it's non-obvious, right? No, no one said the right things for this creature should be this. It was kind of, well, I'm in this, eco this little ecological niche, so I'll just fit in here and grow a bill. Okay, that seems to work. Um, the other thing, and this is something that agile folks find hard, and as an agile folks myself, I find this hard. You kind of want to think that because when you use agile methods in the stuff we're used to, it works so well. My experience has been when I started doing things like pair programming in particular was a real profound experience for me. Learning how TDD works, learning how TDD actually drives design rather than is a testing thing, that was really profound. Just the, the thrill of automating away something really boring and having it never, ever fail again and never irritate me again was wonderful. So, and I just thought, this, surely this is just one of those that applies everywhere. And then you realize that these guys and all of the agile methods in the, you know, the original Snowbird get-together were all 90s methodologies. <coughs> Excuse me, all 90s methodologies. So this is like the turn of the millennium is when they all got together at Snowbird. They were solving a different thing. They weren't trying to solve scaling delivery. They were trying to solve any delivery at all. <laughs> we were dreadful at delivery. We never, we never did it. We'd have these two, three, five-year programs that would rumble on and spend all the money, and then we'd come back and go, oh, sorry, uh, like that. Or better, someone would go, you guys are all idiots. Get them all out. Get the next lot in. And the next lot would come in and say, hey, we've figured out what they did wrong. They're a bunch of idiots. It's going to take us two years to fix it. Oh, okay, let's do that. Agile doesn't have an opinion about scale. Agile has an opinion about getting anything out the door. So the original description of, of Scrum said, look, just target 90-day releases. If you can get down to a release every quarter, you're winning. Right? And what we'll do is we'll sprint to the halfway line, and then we'll sprint to the finish. So we'll have these six-week sprints, and, and then we'll know whether we're even close to delivering something in 90 days. And, and you know, the, the Ken Schwaber's buddies looked at him and said, you're, you're crazy, Ken. We can't deliver anything in 90 days. You know, now if we go more than nine days without a delivery, we can get a bit twitchy. So, so that's what they were trying to solve for. They weren't trying to solve very, very, they weren't trying to solve scaling. Okay? That wasn't even interesting yet. So the problems start with this is that if you are good, and in fact, especially when you're good at agile delivery in the small, if I'm managing a portfolio of work, that's the first one of those big words, portfolio, look at that. If I'm managing a portfolio of work of which your project is one of them, I'm going to start getting a bit concerned because you're not making the same noises as all the other people. Okay? Some of these things are not like the others. I want to tell you a story. Once upon a time, there was a project that I was on. This is back in the ThoughtWorks days. Um, I won't tell you where I was working, because well, as the story unfolds, you'll, you'll realize for yourself. But this happened. We had, we were one project up here. Where are we? There we go. Can you see that? Woo, that does. Guess which project? <laughs> right, so you've got these three very square peg type projects and, and our little twirly agile thing going on. And all of these projects were of a similar size, maybe 50 people. OK, so our, our program team, if you like, had four teams of like 10 people plus some other folks around them. Um, and the other three programs were a similar sort of size. And this would happen. Every month, we would have uh, steering. And we'd report up to the steering. And everyone would go, green, we're green, because that was the answer you were expecting. What color is your project? What's your current status, red, amber, green status? It's green. That's the only allowable answer. So we said, OK, well, then we're green. And then we said, green. And then we said, amber. And they went, what? Yeah, we're, we're amber. And it, Shut up. No, no, we're amber. What do you mean, amber? Is it like, who do I need to fire? Do I need to get rid of the project manager? No, you don't. The, 
the reason we're amber is this, is we have a decision that needs making that's a program level decision, so we don't want to make it locally because we're likely to maybe derail some of the other guys or cause you know, surprises. And we had a really good project manager, and she had identified that what we needed to do was, es was escalate this, to say, hey, steering guys, steer us. And so they weren't used to hearing Amber meant we need some help. They were used to hearing Amber means I need to shout at the project manager, because that's how it goes green again. Okay? So we said, here's the decision we need to make. And they said, oh, well, that's pretty easy. We'll make that decision. Made the decision. Next month, we're all green again. Fantastic. All going well. Next month, we're amber again. They're like, oh, wow. We became known as the whiny project. It's like, you again? You agile folks again? Why do you just keep disturbing us in this? I, I, I come to this steering meeting for a bit of a lie down. You know, this is my quiet time. You want me to what, make decisions? Uh, and, and, and of course, as big organizations do, they rumble along, didn't make a decision. Next month, we reported red. Now, they don't like projects reporting red because they then have to start telling people, okay, having your project in red status is a reportable offense, right? So, so they said, what do you mean red? And we said, well, you know the decision we needed you to make last month because that would put us at risk. Well, you didn't make it, and now we're at risk. Because red means we are materially at risk of not delivering. And so we need you to make that decision. And they went, oh, oh, so actually these red, amber, green statuses are about us and the program, not about your project. Yes. Ah, oh, OK, we hadn't thought about that. And so then, business as usual. Whew. And so this carried on through the year. Every now and then, oh, amber, amber. You know, because we needed a decision made, making or we needed some help. There was something that needed to happen that was bigger than the project. So maybe you know, things like hardware, right? When you're, on a, when you're in a big organization, you can't just go get hardware. You need this whole process. And if there's a portfolio of projects like this, the chances are there's going to be a hardware, like a procurement function somewhere buried deep in the PMO. Um, and, and in our case, there was. And so that's where some of those later ambers were. Like, you know, we, we still haven't seen the, the production kit that you're shipping from wherever at a vastly inflated rate rather than just buying it locally. And so then this happened. Got to the end of the year. That project failed. That project failed. That project failed. One of the projects delivered. One of them. And this isn't a they suck story. This is a this is what happens when you are trying to make decisions off bad information. OK? Now, luckily, they the program, the, the, the project that we were involved in delivering had enough of an upside that it funded the, the rescue of all of those for over the next year or whatever. But there were four comparable projects. One of them delivered, three of them didn't. And the thing I learned was we weren't talking the same language as the other projects, and it was on us, right? When you start changing stuff, you need to go to the people who were in, in whose environment you're changing. You can't just expect them to get on board. And there's a certain, and I'm guilty of this as anyone, there's a certain kind of arrogance or a belief in the process. Like, surely, just look at what we're doing. It's patently, self-evidently better than the thing you've been doing. Therefore, get on board. OK? There's, it doesn't really work like that. Uh, um, and And... A, f a few years ago, a chap called Richard Dernal, um, who's one of the smartest lean operations folks I've ever worked with, uh, blogged a wonderful, wonderful article. It's on richarddernal.com. It's called Agile Adoption Patterns. Um, I take issue with two of the words in that title. Okay? The thing he describes isn't really agile adoption. The early part of it is agile adoption. The rest of it is basically lean organization change. And the things he describes aren't patterns. OK. Uh, um, other than that, it's spot on. But the model is really good. So, uh, so let, let me just walk you through it. And it kind of frames the rest of what I want to talk about. OK. So the first thing that happens when you start some kind of agile adoption, the people break. OK. What does that mean? That means we are, we're changing their working environment. We're changing what they do. We're changing how they're, what, what good looks like. Right? We're changing how, how they work. Um, we're often changing you know, the, the teams they sit in. I'm used to sitting as a business analyst. I'm used to sitting with all my business analyst buddies on the fourth floor. And now you're, what, you're pulling me out to sit with a team of smelly programmers? Do you know who I am? 
right? You get this kind of thing going on. So the people break. They're, they're confused. Uh, they're, it's, this is change. This is difficult. And as well, we need to be very aware of, they didn't sign up for this. Okay? I'm working at a large American bank at the moment, and we're busy causing all kinds of mayhem um, organizationally. And a lot of the people involved didn't sign up for that. They've literally been working in this bank for 20-something years. They've been working in this one job, or in this one organization. They've had many jobs. They've been working in this one organization for, you know, for as long as I've been working. And I've been in lots of different companies. I, I don't usually last very long. Um, so, uh, yeah. And, and we've come in and just completely moved their cheese, right? We've said, okay, well, now we're going to do it. And, and some of them are really game. They're saying, oh, you know, I've been here 20 something years, and I'm a senior, senior, senior manager, and I'm going to throw in my title, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come along and just join a, join a delivery team. You're like, whoa, that's pretty cool. Um, some of them are just, you can see the whites of their eyes. They're terrified, okay? We, we're, we're breaking stuff around them. So, okay, so as people start to get on board with it, they suddenly realize the tools break. They realize that the, the, the uh, control mechanisms they had, the things they used to measure, don't apply anymore. So in, in old world, we measure activity, we measure busyness, we measure, because we can see those things. Uh, we measure maybe tickets closed in some support function. Uh, um, so that, that's what we're trying to, we, me we might measure utilization. Utilization is a good thing to measure because I can look around and I can see if someone's busy. And so the, uh, the perverse incentive there, well, what's going to happen? As soon as someone looks at me, I'm going to just start typing. Okay, I, I can look busy with the best of them, don't worry. Uh, um, there's a lovely Dilbert a few years ago. I said, okay, we're going to start rewarding people for, for lines of code produced. Dilbert says, I'm going to go code me a new car. <laughs> don't need to. Okay, so. But we're good at that as well. So we're good at things like uh, introducing tooling. We've gotten really good at that. So then what happens is this. The governance breaks. What do I mean by governance? I'm going to come back to this again and again in this talk, because this, I think, is the crux of everything. Governance is this. Are we OK? Are we investing in the right things? How do we know what we're doing? How do we know whether we're on track? OK? This is the first point at which we start to Whoa, hang what is there in the manifesto about governance? like program level governance, multi-project, multiple work stream governance, interdependency governance. That, well, there kind of isn't anything, so we're going to need to figure some stuff out. Once we get the hang of governance and all of those sorts of things, so now we've, now we've, now we've scaled. Okay, we've done the first level of scaling, if you like. We've understood what it means like to manage a portfolio of things. Each thing is locally doing fine. OK, well, then what happens? Well, then the next thing that happens is the customer breaks. Now, for a lot of you folks, I suspect, when I first saw this, I thought, hang on a minute, we've solved customer. On-site customer, or product owner, whatever your flavor of Agile might be. We've got this, the customer. What do you mean the customer breaks? Well, at scale, the customer is no longer the customer. The customer is a nebulous concept. OK? The customer is really a placeholder for the product direction. OK? or understanding the market. So it's, uh, it's all of the different kinds of market and, and, and product kind of roles. So product management, market uh, engineering, all that kind of stuff is all tied up in the idea of the customer. So one of my pieces of work that I'm, I'm, I'm helping out with at this bank has 50, I'll say it again, 50 director-level people, senior-level people, all clamoring for work through this very, very narrow pipe okay, of you know, a small number of teams who are able to deliver. And managing the expectations across 50 people is an incredibly hard job. Okay? It's actually several people's job just to manage the expectations of these people before this stuff ever even hits the pipe. Okay? Understanding how stakeholders respond to better information, different information. Uh, when you start talking about cycle times and flow and throughput and lead times and, and SLAs around that kind of stuff versus uh, all of the Gantt charty things they're used to seeing is a complete adjustment. And then, okay, so then what happens? Well, now we've got the hang of getting all these people to, f you know, to, to understand things like opportunity cost and cost of delay and all of that. Great, then what? Well, then the money breaks. 
or the funding or the financial controls, however you want to look at it. We're used to being in top-down, cost-accounted organizations. Anywhere in the West is pretty much that's how it works. You have the, the people at the top of the organization have big pots of cash, and then they have now smaller pots of cash, smaller pots of cash down to your project. Okay? So we have this very this hierarchical uh, dribble down of, of money, and we're trying to get work going across the organization, and those things don't work together. <coughs> And once you can start seeing people from very different parts of the organization wanting something that cuts across all those different parts of the organization, how you fund that becomes a non-trivial problem. There's, I, I'm looking at work that hasn't started, that hasn't started for months. Not because no one wants it to start, but because they still haven't figured out between them who should pay for what. Okay. It's like, it's heartbreaking. But it happens. Finally, finally, if you're really, really lucky and if you have a whole bunch of things come together, Finally, the organization breaks. This is the point at which now we've got our, our sort of throughput accounting and our beyond budgeting, and, and now we've got some very senior people in the organization prepared to take a massive risk of, of rebuilding the organization around value streams, around customers, around flow. Um, I think I've seen this once, and I might be exaggerating the number one. Okay, with the amount of snake oil I'm hearing about scaling like it's a solved problem. Do my thing, it's a solved problem. It really is not a solved problem. It's an incredibly hard problem. It's something you can chip away at and something you can have an impact on and something in some organizations you can have a significant and lasting impact on. But boy, is it, it's not a solved problem. Okay, so where next? This is so much fun. Okay, uh, this is where we are. You see this? You are here. We are between stage two, stage three. Okay, that's where we've been for about the last 10 years. To be fair, that's where Agile started. Agile said, I want to get past the people and the tools, right? Because that's delivery. I want to solve delivery. And the only person, I'm not going to say the only person, the only methodology in that room in Snowbird in 2001 that even had an opinion about scaling um, was Alistair Coburn's crystal. And that's because it was a whole family of methods. And the family of methods were actually a, uh, a way of codifying how, what, what, what various axes of hard something was. So is it like from, from it's the impact of failure? So impact of failure is someone gets a bit annoyed, da -da 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 -da, someone dies. Okay? <laughs> so there was like a bit annoying, uh, business impacting, which is like it's going to cost us some money, uh, business critical is going to shut us down, life critical. So that's your four. And then he has another axis, which is how big of a problem, how many people is it going to involve, because that's another level of, of complexity. And there's, there's several dimensions to this. And that's one of the reasons people aren't doing crystal now, is it's really hard to even get the model in your head. And the model is a massive simplification of what actually happens. Right? So you are here. So I thought of this, I thought if I flip this on its side, I could maybe illustrate this slightly differently. Okay, um, has anybody read The Leprechauns of Software Engineering? Any hands? No. Okay, it's on, it's on Lean Pub, so it's like, it costs like not very much. Um, wonderful, wonderful, uh, very short ebook. Uh, the Leprechauns of Software Engineering. Um, what, 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 what he does is he looks at received wisdom that's been handed down from software engineer to software engineer through the, through the ages and just drives a truck through it. So you know the thing about that we've got data that some programmers are 10 times more productive than other programmers? No, we don't. No, that was made up. Right, that was made up. You know the thing about the exponential cost of change, which actually is about the exponential cost of discovering a defect, which is often just the exponential cost of anything as a project goes on? No data. There is no data for that. Okay, go read the Leprechauns of Software Engineering. It's a, it's a fun and slightly unsettling read. So, in the light of that, this is not a graph. There is no data behind this. This is subjective, this is qualitative, this is the experience I've had. So, here's what I've seen. I've seen that getting past the people and tools bit is solvable, is deterministically solvable, is deterministically solvable in a reasonable amount of time. If you tell me various things about your organization and about your people and about your products and about what you do, I can come up with a pretty good 
stab at how many people for how long is it going to take to be able to make a significant impact on those two levels. Um, just because I've done it a bunch of times, and I've worked with people who've done it a bunch of times, and this is, this is where our, our, the consulting end, certainly, of, of the Agile world has been for the last decade or so. Um, around about between tools and governance, in fact, what I'm going to do is put an extra thing in here. You see this? This is a lot like the crossing the chasm thing. Am I getting a red dot? Can you see it? No, there it is. No, can you see that red dot? You can't see a red dot. OK, I need to get a different uh, pointer. There's a question mark there. We don't know, usually, how to get past breaking the tools and introducing better tools. And by tools, I mean things like systems, methodology, uh, processes, as well as actual tools, you know, planning and tracking tools, and automation tools, and development tools. Like so so there, there's organizational tools as well. We're good at that. Okay, We've seen enough of that to get good at it. The, the, the getting onto the governance bit, how do we scale this? How do we report it? How do we make it make sense? That's a lot harder. Okay, so, um, so I call this thing here, this thing in the middle here, the chasm of credibility. Okay, I don't hear, when I speak to agile folks, or particularly these days, sometimes I'll be in the room on the client side of you know, some fairly senior folks talking to maybe an uh, agile consulting firm. And we'll be talking about things like governance. And we'll say, so how do you do planning and tracking? Well, uh, oh no, c can you tell us how long this thing will take? Well, not exactly, no. OK. Um, I'm going to need to know how long it's going to take, how much it's going to cost me. And then I hear them saying the things I used to say. And boy, does it sound embarrassing from my side of the table. Because they say things like, well, you can't know. It's impossible to know. Everyone else who tells you a number, they're, they're lying. They're making it up, you know, because they can't know. It's, it's unknowable. What we'll do is this, is after a few sprints, what's a sprint? Oh, two weeks. OK, after a few pairs of weeks, we'll be able to tell you what our velocity is in story points, and then we can figure that out to a burn up that will give you a range of what? Eight. When's it going to be done? How much do I need to spend on this problem? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to start with a team, and they're going to have a sprint zero, and they're going to, what? Stop. Stop using those words at me. Right? Tell me how you are going to govern. Tell me how you're going to convince me that there will be responsible activity ensuring delivery of this thing. Well, what we're going to do, it's, it's, and you just see this thing go around, and eventually one of them just gets worn down. You know, sometimes it's the client that says, oh, just start. Just start and see what happens. And I go, yes, we just won. And uh, yeah. And again, we're not doing it because we're, we, we don't want to give them good answers. It's that we've convinced ourselves that there aren't good answers. And we've convinced ourselves of the arguments why, and so we're going with the arguments rather than taking a stab at the answers. We are as uncomfortable with uncertainty, ironically, as, as, the, organizer, as the traditional folks with their big Gantt charts. So what do I mean by governance? Like, <laughs> you use this word. I do not think it means what you think it means. Um, what do we mean by governance? Well, execution is what we do. Execution is project level stuff. Okay? Execution is getting code, getting product out the door. But, and, and in the small, that's pretty much all you need. Right? But now what happens is when you have multiple work streams going on, you need a thing called delivery assurance. How do I know that the various pieces across my program are going to make sense? Okay? How do I know that? What, 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 are the, what are the interdependencies? What are the impacts? If this thing's late, is there a knock-on effect to these other things? How many things work in parallel? Who needs to know about what? And this is where I want to have an eye to those local optimizations that might derail stuff versus the local optimizations, which are absolutely fine to stay local. And then finally, governance is the piece across that that says, uh, how do I what am I investing in? Am I investing in the right things? What's my expected ROI? It's sort of a business case and that kind of stuff. So, and these top two also go by the name portfolio management. So now, if we look just very, very briefly, I'm going to go into these in a little bit more detail, but very briefly, let's look at what we care about uh, um, in, each, in each of these situations. So portfolio management is balancing options. It's saying, here's a bunch of things I could invest in. Which ones should I invest in? What are the relative weightings of those things? Which things matter? Which things don't matter? Oh, hang on. This thing's turning out to be more expensive than I thought. Uh, what decision am I going to make based on that information? 
Uh, this thing is coming less expensive than I thought. I now can do some other stuff, discretionary stuff. What should I do? Because okay, so it's those kind of conversations. So what happens then? What happens at these different levels? Well, this is usually what happens. This plan, do, check. Well, it's actually plan, do, check, act. But I prefer adapt. I think it's more uh, descriptive of what happens. So this is, this is the, the, the lean description of, of how, di how discovery and delivery works. It's lovely. So plan. Have an experiment. Have a, you know, we're going to build this product. We're going to try this thing. Do it, uh, um, and then validate it. See whether it worked, and then change your mind based on that. Change your direction based on that. And so adapt might be do the same thing but more. It might be do a different thing. We've done enough of that thing now. It might be, uh, oh, hang on a minute. That was a surprise. Uh, um, how are we doing for time? I think I'm doing OK. Uh, um, that was a bit of a surprise. Uh, we should probably back out that change. So I was in Spotify recently, um, just for a few days. And you know how you sort of think they're going to be a really cool company with all cool stuff and a really cool office? They are. <laughs> so that's quite a fun week. Um, so they have this riff on that, which I really like. Think it, build it, ship it, tweak it. Now, I also think there's a subliminal reference to Pop Will Eat Itself from the early 90s. So if anyone else gets that reference, then, then let me know. Um, but it's just a really nice, it's, it's, and they've actually got this on the walls in the building. Think it, build it, ship it, tweak it, um, is what we do. And we go around cycles and cycles of that. OK, so that's team scale. OK, so you have, well, they call them squads, but that's team scale. It's locally optimized. Your team makes team decisions. Off they go, running, all that stuff. And you know what? We're really good at this. This is the thing that Agile is and does incredibly well. OK, this is the thing that I, in the 90s, when I was uh, about five, six years into my career, I was OK at programming. The, the thing that I felt was a sea change in my capability to solve problems was when I started doing some of this other stuff. Kent Beck describes it brilliantly. He says, I'm not a great programmer. I'm a good programmer with great habits. I disagree. I think he's a great programmer as well. But what I did was stole a bunch of his habits in the early 2000s, and that worked out quite well. So that's execution. We're good at this. Okay? This is the thing we're good at. What, but the, the takeaway is that that expertise, that skill, that capability isn't transferable. It doesn't mean you can necessarily do the next bit. So what's delivery assurance about? It's cross-team concerns. It's understanding what's interesting across those teams. It's product trade-offs. So do you know what? On your work stream, on the, on the part of the product you're involved in, here's some things that, that you need to do, and you can prioritize those, and that's all fine. And then on another work stream over here, there's some other stuff going on. Oh, do you know what? We've realized that we need to shift the weighting of these entire parts of the product. So we need to get more of this through the pipe at the expense of some of that. So listen, team A over here, we're going to actually shift your direction a bit. But we're doing fine. I know you are. And I'm, if this isn't about you, I'm really sorry. There's a program level thing that we need to shift. Yeah. Well, A, the, pro the project team could, couldn't have known that. From the data they've got, looking inwards to their project, they can't know that because they don't see across the whole program, yeah? And, yeah, unless they're involved in that as well. So that's why you need that kind of broad look. Technical trade-offs. OK, so as each team discovers a thing, and that thing might have a far-reaching impact, they often don't go and talk to the other teams. Right? So they'll, 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 uh, the amount of times I've seen on, on a fairly you know, modest-sized program, maybe 50 people or something, three different databases. There'll be some Oracle stuff, some SQL Server stuff, and maybe some Mongo. Yeah, and, you know, wh wh why did you make those choices? Oh, just fancied it. Oh, we had a guy in the team that knows SQL Server, so he was really up. You know, we said that these other guys were using Oracle, and he said, not on my project. <coughs> and so, so we didn't use that. And, and so now, again, from each local silo of team, it makes a lot of sense, right? From a program level, someone's the other side of that, usually wearing a uh, a motorhead t-shirt with long hair and often with sandals going, why have I got three of these things to manage? Yeah. So your operations folks are looking at this going, why did no one think of me? Okay, so the technical concerns across the whole program are about how do we figure out the ecosystem of delivery. And sometimes we're good at this. Okay, I've seen agile programs that have really, really good delivery assurance figuring this stuff out and doing this really well. OK, governance. Oh, scary word. What happens in governance? Well, things like this, organizational concerns. 
Should we even be funding this? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll reference Chris Matz again because he's one of my favorite people in this space. Uh, um, he's done a lot of work with uh, what's called real options. Uh, um, he was involved with a large energy company in the uh, early 2000s. And he was on a 50 million pound program of work, which is about 12 kroner at the moment. I don't know if you've seen the exchange rate. We're not doing so well. Uh, um, about 50 million pound program of work. He was responsible, or he was the business analyst on a 20 million pound piece of it. And he was scratching his head saying, this thing doesn't make sense. Um, I can see why we're doing this, but I don't see how the rest of it, how it fits in with the rest of the pieces. I don't understand how the program works. And his, he sent an email to his boss, and his boss sent an email back saying, pretty much, shut up, Chris. Huh. No, I really don't understand why we're doing this thing, and it's going to cost 20 million pounds. Uh, send. What Chris didn't know is that in the time it took him to respond, his boss had gone on holiday. His email escalated to his boss, who was the CFO. And the CFO said, about this 20 million pound hole in our program, I wonder if you could, within 24 hours, let me know exactly what that means. Um, and then it turned out that the whole thing simply didn't hold water. It was one of these massive vanity projects. And so they cancelled it. Okay? I think that is an epic, epic win of governance. 50 million pounds didn't get spent. Literally years of people's lives didn't get wasted doing a thing that simply would never have worked. And so now, what's the opportunity cost of that? All of that time and money can be diverted to something else. Yeah? Wow. So organizational concerns. There isn't a, 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 there isn't a test for that, right? Um, investment trade-offs. Which things should we be investing in? And this is at a strategy level. This is like, should we be investing in saving costs or uh, increasing visibility of information or uh, moving into new territories? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe there's a relatively low-risk way of exploring those things. Maybe there isn't. Okay? Maybe it is an all-or-nothing decision. I need to really spend some time thinking about it. Portfolio balancing. Has anyone heard of portfolio balancing? I didn't think so. We don't usually even get exposed at this level. Okay? But this is the kind of information that needs to bubble up. So, um, so we want to surface the right information. And the problem we have, or not the problem, the challenge we have for scaling Agile, for take it, for being, and when I, when I say scaling Agile, what I mean is this. I love the incredible uh, effectiveness of applying Agile methods at the execution level. It is world beating. I've not found anything else. As soon as I do, I'll drop it like a stone and start doing the new thing. Okay? I simply haven't, and I've been looking pretty hard for about 10 years. Right? We, the stuff we do at an execution space is brilliant. What I'm trying to figure out is what's the, what, what's the thing it needs to be and what's the soil it needs to be in in order to thrive. So there's two kinds of conversations. There's this conversation that goes on between governance and delivery assurance. Are we investing in the right things? Well, let's see, are they on track? Well, what does on track mean? Well, you know, budget, return on investment, yada, yada. And then because of that, delivery assurance as a conversation with execution. And you can see where the sort of feedback happens. And you can pick each one of these four off. What does governance say to assurance? What does assurance say to execution? And, 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 and so on. Each of those conversations, what should the content of those conversations be? What should each layer be telling and hearing from each other layer in order to make good decisions, in order to, to, to run the ship? How are we doing for time? Four minutes left. OK, I should move a lot faster. Um, so what matters to delivery assurance? Have we learned anything new that might materially affect the delivery? Right? Uh, are we nearly there yet? Right? Delivery assurance is like the five-year-olds in the back of the car. You're driving on holiday. Are we nearly there yet? Are we nearly Have we learned anything that might materially affect stuff? Because if so, I need, to, I need to make some decisions. Governance. Are our investments aligned with our objectives? Two moving parts there. Objectives change based on market and economy and all kinds of other stuff. And investments, the choices of investments change as you learn stuff from delivery assurance. And is there anything we should be doing differently? How do we surface that? So then, contextual consistency. Whew, I got there. Right. <laughs> We're going to go through very quickly. Is this. The first thing is you need to create and share a clear vision. This is a technical vision, a product vision, a directional vision, a organizational vision. This needs to be, this is the, uh, 
Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, the guy who wrote The Little Prince, uh, has this wonderful description about if you want to build a if you want to get a group of people to build a ship, don't tell them about wood and carving and all that. Give them a taste for the ocean. Describe what it feels like in their hair. Yeah? They'll build you a ship. Create a vision. Guiding principles enable people to do things locally. Okay? Um, what that needs is strong and consistent leadership. I thought long and hard about these words. Strong leadership, it has to be opinionated. Not dogmatic, but opinionated. It has to listen, but it has to be strong enough to make decisions. And consistent. If you're changing your boss, you know, your, your management team in your business, every, you know, apparently the, the, the current half-life of a CIO is like 18 months. Right? Nothing's going to happen in 18 months at that level. Someone needs to decide this is a 10-year play and this is what they're going to do. Okay, this is what uh, Beata Bogsnes, I just pronounced his name really badly, has been doing uh, uh, um, in, in Statoil, or was doing in Statoil for a long time, is this. And he's stuck with it and he's championed it. So what that means now, this is the empowerment piece. Once everyone has those global principles, once everyone knows what the decision-making framework looks like, they can make good local decisions. They know what kinds of decisions are local and what kinds of decisions need to be surfaced. Um, this I've stolen directly from Beyond Budgeting. All decisions need to be transparent, all decisions need to be accountable. What does that mean? That means anyone can decide to do stuff, to spend money, to invest, to change direction, to whatever it is. But if anyone calls you on it, and anyone's allowed to call you on it, have an answer. Okay? Have a case. Make the case. And again, strong and collaborative leadership. Okay, so this is at a team level as well. Collaborative is not committee. Okay, collaborative is not consensus. Consensus means everyone decides to compromise and everyone resents the decision. Collaborative is everyone is heard, someone sets the direction. Okay, difference between Ernest Shackleton and uh, um, Scott of the Antarctic. Okay, one of them brought all the people back, the other one died and is much more famous. I don't understand how that works. So this is, my, this is the tweetable definition, if you like, of contextual consistency. Given the same context, given the same constraints, we are likely to make the same decisions. OK? Um, because that means now some of this stuff happens. So here's some of my guiding principles. We don't have time to go into many of these today. Um, this top right one, differences data. If we're all working off the same conceptual framework, the same guiding principles, the same vision, and you're doing something different from what I would, that's data. I can look at that and go, oh, you're doing something I wouldn't do. I wonder what's different in your context that's causing you to do that, rather than, you're an idiot and I need to hit you with a stick. Okay. So, differences data says, if we all have this shared vision, um, then it means that we're all able, we're empowered to make good local decisions knowing what the landscape is. Okay, let's have a look at one more. Uh, looking where the action isn't. This is about kind of opportunity cost, cost of delay, value stream mapping, all that stuff where you put floodlights on the gaps in between the process or the gaps in between the systems. Yeah, because that is almost always where the cost is, where the waste is, where the massive, massive uh, gains are to be made. We tend to look where the action is, we look where the noise is, which is why for literally over a century we've been measuring effort and activity and utilization rather than things like queue depth, um, cost of delay, those kind of things. So, wrapping up. I'm out of time for questions, I'm afraid. Uh, um, so, scaling is more than just small things bigger. Okay? You can't take Agile and you can't take the, the car and make it float. If you want the car to float, you need to put it on a big boat. Okay? It can float, but it needs something that is substantively different from the car itself. Okay? Guiding principles, strong leadership, start to lay the groundwork for that to happen. Crossing the chasm of credibility is really hard. It's not impossible. It's really hard, and it's a different thing. And this is where I think we're going. This is, where, this is really exciting for me, because you know, I've been to this conference in particular a number of times, and you see themes over, over, over years. It's really interesting. And this is the first time I'm really hearing a, a, you know, a, a number of people talking about we're trying to make these you know, organizational impact. 
And that's very exciting. We're going to struggle with it a lot, but it's a really exciting struggle to have. Um, thanks.